let's move on to uh, uh, the the more quantitative analysis of uh, cardiac output. This is so first section we've done, and now uh, what I've been mentioning that there is a more mathematical or more uh, how shall I, how, how shall we say a more quantitative uh, way to to see uh, the regulation of cardiac output, uh, those factors, stroke volume, and all that, and and venous return that we discussed in the first uh, lecture. Uh, there's more uh, a graphical way to uh, clarify these things. So in this, we'll be discussing a cardiac function curve. We'll be discussing a vascular function curve, and then we'll talk about uh, how and when they intersect. Okay. So just ignore this. This is uh, probably repetition. Just look at this. So remember the the the, the graph that I uh, the diagram that I mentioned the uh, pump and the two tubes and I asked you I left you with a question that if you remove the stuff if you remove your blood from the venous side and pump the same blood into the arterial side aren't you removing uh, venous blood uh, to the arterial side such that the ve the venous pressure should drop and what is this this is uh, this seems to be an anomaly and I left it as a question so basically the answer now starts to uh, reveal uh, there needs to be an equilibrium between the heart and the circulation. So if uh, we need to say it like this, and you will immediately understand what, what, what is being said. If the blood is removed from the venous side and introduced into the arterial side, then obviously the arterial side film of blood is pushed enough so that it makes up for the decrease in volume on the venous side. Remember I mentioned and I even gave you a hint yesterday that I said that the whole thing is a continuous film. So if you remove a part of the film and push it inside the arteries, the arterial film will be pushed equally forwards so that it eventually in the round, if it's, let's just imagine that it's one simple circle, the whole circle just gets pushed in an equal amount forwards so that you never have a situation where you are uh, you miss uh, there is a beat where you don't have venous return because basically it's the same blood rotating in a in a sequential way okay and if the heart contracts more if you understand this point till now that there needs to be equilibrium between uh, the heart removing the blood and introducing into the arterial side let's let's introduce some issues what if venous return somehow increases the heart being constant then that needs to be studied isn't it yes what if in, a, in another scenario in another problem you have more contract contractility of the heart with the same venous return what 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 happens then to understand these things to understand the equilibrium uh, we need to have some sort of graphical uh, or more quantitative methods to study it so before i introduce those let me recap this. Why do we need to go into quantitative methods? Well, it's because heart and circulation, they are in, in, in sync. Okay. The heart cannot do what circulation cannot provide and, and vice versa. What good is a circulation for if the heart is not pumping blood in it and so on. So both of them, they complete each other. Okay. And there is a there is a sink there is an equilibrium between what the circulation how the circulation behaves uh, so we have been talking about the venous side only what about the arterial side if there is hypertension in the arterial side if you increase uh, the total peripheral resistance how will the heart behave in this situation how will the venous return behave in this situation okay what if you increase blood volume in the whole system while heart being constant Nothing's wrong with the heart. There is no sympathetic stimulation. You have just increased blood volume. Okay. All of these questions, they change the equilibrium profile of the heart and circulation. And since cardiovascular is one system, we need to understand how these changes affect cardiovascular system as a system. We have been discussing it separately effects on the heart and separately effects on the circulation today. Now, we will discuss in the following three, three or so slides 
how do, do these changes affect the cardiovascular system together? So uh, we will look at uh, basically two curves and you need to be comfortable with these two curves, okay? One is, as you can see, one is uh, the cardiac curve, okay? And the other is the vascular curve. The cardiac curve is plotted by plotting cardiac output against the CVP, okay? So you increase the CVP by how does the CVP, which basically is right atrial pressure, when does it increase? It increases when there is more venous return, yes? So there is more venous return, uh, the CVP is increasing, but at the same time, uh, the cardiac output also increases. Who says that? Frank Starling Law says that. So more the CVP, more should be the cardiac output, okay? Just to complete the argument, if the heart does not oblige and you have increasing CVP, then eventually uh, the CVP will drop. We've just studied the, uh, the curve, uh, the venous return curve, okay? Because uh, the right atrial pressure would rise, uh, will, will, which will retard the incoming venous uh, blood towards the heart, okay? So this is basically a frank starling law relationship that is being uh, discussed one more time, okay? Okay, the venous side is essentially, if you, if you notice, is essentially the venous return curve. Look at the MSFP at seven, and as you go, as you decrease the CVP, venous return improves, at, it, it, it hits a point, a transition point, after which uh, it basically flattens. This is where the great vessels, uh, the venous vessels basically collapse, okay? Uh, this has, uh, this gets affected by all sorts of changes in blood volume, the TPR, uh, vascular compliance, and so on. So, this is the final point. This is the frontier. This is your heart. This is the circulation. Let's bring them together. Okay, so this is bringing them together. Uh, this is, if you pay attention, the blue curve is basically the cardiac function curve. This is the cardiac curve, right? And the red, the maroonish curve is basically the vascular curve. Observe these, make yourself comfortable because the next two slides will be tricky. So uh, if you plot them in one graph, they all naturally would intersect at one place, right here, the blue, the blue point, right? Well, imagine, uh, no, no, no surprises should be there. It basically corresponds to, if you are solving it for the heart, a cardiac output of five liters per minute, which is the normal cardiac output at rest, right? And it corresponds to a nice uh, right atrial pressure, the CVP of around plus two. So right in the middle, it's not zero, it's not plus four, it's right in the middle, it's optimal performance. So uh, said it in other way, uh, the venous return, which is basically also, mind you, five liters a minute, uh, when that venous return is being achieved, it's coming back to the heart, the heart is pumping the same, right? So this intersection point, both at five, is both for cardiac output and for venous return. Venous return is bringing in five liters per minute. Cardiac output is set at five liters per minute of pumping, okay? Which keeps, and remember these words now, which keeps the right atrial pressure nice and cozy at plus two. Remember, it is the interplay of venous return and cardiac and or cardiac output, which will disturb the right atrial pressure, as we'll see in the following graphs, okay? Uh, again, this is uh, uh, basically the same venous curve. That's why he's shown the mean systemic filling pressure. Uh, it's coming back. This is basically the standard venous return curve. It's intersecting, intersecting at the cardiac curve at this point. This, by the way, is called the equilibration point. Okay, the point of equilibrium or the equilibration point. Okay, so that's that. Uh, he, he has mentioned, uh, I have mentioned rather, the cardiac output can be altered by uh, anything which shifts the cardiac curve, shifts the venous curve, or uh, disturbs both curves at the same time. So exciting time come, come, coming up, saddle up. So this, observe this graph. 
these two graphs. First observe graph A. B will just follow if you understand this. What has happened? Firstly, see what has not, which curve has not been disturbed. Basically, the Venus curve is not being disturbed. It's the same. Okay. It's the cardiac curve. Something has happened to it. It has shifted upwards and to the left along the Venus curve, the Venus curve being constant. So a positive inotropic agent has been introduced. So you have basically activated the sympathetic nervous system. Norepinephrine is now available. The heart is contracting more. And this is what I mentioned. Now, think about the following. Heart will, the stroke volume will enhance. The heart rate will enhance. Okay, the cardiac output is up. It's right here. First, it was here. Now, it's here. Okay. However, what has not changed? The venous return hasn't changed. Okay. The venous return hasn't shifted really. It's the same. Uh, it is from this point to this point, basically, heart is quote unquote borrowing more blood than it previously was working with. First, it was working at right here. Now it's it's taking more from the bucket of quote unquote the venous return because it, its pumping profile has increased on the same venous return. Okay, you need to understand this point. So obviously, somebody has to pay for this cost. Well, guess what? If you look at the CVP, first it was nice and cozy at plus two. Now the CVP has decreased. So whatever blood would remain in the right atrium after the cardiac systole and exert that nice plus one plus two mmhg pressure it will have decreased it would become say uh, a plus one or more towards zero because you have taken that blood you have borrowed that blood by a more aggressive heart contraction okay so cardiac output net net result is cardiac output will increase at the cost of a decreasing central venous pressure. Remember, the volumes are constant, hence you cannot have a situation, you cannot have a, a increased volume for your cardiac output. No, sir. This increased cardiac output will come from the same blood volume, the same venous return. You are just borrowing from within the heart, you are borrowing more blood, which you did not, uh, 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 what, what you call it? Uh, which you did not bring into uh, duty before. Also, sympathetic stimulation would again uh, stress the volume, uh, unstressed volume into stressed volume, which will, which will, in, which will increase the uh, uh, equilibration point at a higher venous return. Okay. So now, first it was uh, operating at this lower venous return, but on the same volume, what you have done is you have displaced the unstressed volume into stressed volume. Uh, the heart will now operate at a higher point along the venous return curve. Okay, so this comes at the cost of a decreased CV. I hope this is clear. If you have any questions, you can always ask me in the comment section below. Uh, so that's one thing. The opposite is is really obvious. Don't need to explain that. A negative inotropic uh, uh, agent would decrease the uh, slope of the heart downwards. And uh, uh, the equilibration point also will move downwards. Okay, the CVP would increase because the heart is not clearing out enough blood. Uh, blood will start to uh, be dumped in the right, right right side of the heart, increasing the right uh, atrial pressure, and which will retard the venous return as well. As you can see, it has dropped. Okay, so this is that. This is basically the effect of inotropic agents which alter the cardiac function curve. Now coming to uh, something which will basically alter the vascular function curve. So remember, in the first set of uh, the inotropic slide, we disturbed the, deviated the cardiac function curve. Here, we are disturbing the vascular function curve while the cardiac curve is constant. This needs to be remembered. Okay. Sometimes when you go deep into these concepts, you tend to forget that only one parameter has been changed, not the other one. The other one needs to be constant for this to make sense. Okay. So now imagine that the blood volume has increased. 
the first thing that you need to think whenever you are told blood volume has increased is forget about everything just look at what is happening at the msfp side the filling pressure so the the fixed line is normal the dotted line is what has changed you see that the jumping of the uh, uh, filling pressure from this point to a higher point something that we have discussed uh, in the previous the three interconnecting slide second graph okay this is exactly what that is so this filling pressure has jumped from the normal plus seven to this new higher point uh, uh, here and now basically at a higher volume it has it will improve the venous return uh, and as you can see the venous return curve is uh, for pound to pound it basically is at a higher side at a higher volume naturally uh, which now displaces uh, this equilibration point to a higher equilibration point because the blood volume increased the venous return increased okay and when the venous return increased the heart had to oblige uh, it was uh, doing its own business but when you increase the uh, venous return uh, due to frank starling law uh, it improved its cardiac output to match the increased venous return and and the dot of equilibration basically shifted from uh, this point along the normal heart curve to a new equilibration point and hence this is now the new uh, adjusted equilibration when you have changed a parameter on the circulation side so just to remind you the this is now the whole cardiovascular system if you can appreciate what happened when you changed one aspect of circulation it resulted in change in cardiac performance as well similar to what happened when you increase the cardiac contractility profile in the previous slide you didn't you didn't do anything with the circulation but what you did was you increased the contraction of the heart it had a chain it had an influence on the circulation okay same is the case with when you uh, bring about a change in say blood volume uh, then all sorts of uh, changes need to be uh, uh, need to happen in the entire system so that there is equilibrium between the vascular and the cardiac curves okay right uh, you can also uh, argue about compliance uh, so if uh, you compress this is again the same thing that i mentioned earlier it's more detailed here if you basically uh, uh, compress the, the 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 veins the unstressed volume basically comes into play uh, and that has a similar effect as introducing more volume to the to the to the circulation uh, so uh, you in in a scenario uh, the examiner can ask you uh, the same thing if uh, the blood volume has increased this will happen uh, venous return will improve cardiac output will improve cvp uh, will be uh, raised as well because you have basically loaded the system with more volume right so even the cvp you, you can see the cvp was here now it has basically increased a bit okay uh, the same the same uh, uh, result can be achieved without changing the blood volume but constricting the veins the same the same whole three parameters will behave in the same way if you uh, uh, bring the unstressed volume stored in the veins uh, into 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 duty into stressed volume and uh, it will shift the curve uh, uh, to the right and the same things happen will happen so remember this scenario basically is comprises of two scenarios one is blood volume increases or compliance basically uh, uh, the, the the vessel constricts so compliance decreases okay this can be off throwing but if you understand it conceptually this is fine compliance is decreasing okay uh, right uh, so this scenario the mirror is this scenario you can just work it out how this curve basically falls down uh, and the cardiac curve being constant it's just the mirror of this scenario number a okay right what is left now <clears throat> is this so this is the 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 punisher of both uh, the curves uh, the tpr so if you uh, if you increase the total peripheral resistance now you need to remember how do you increase the total peripheral resistance which part of the circulation do you do you go and and, and increase uh, tighten the screws on 
uh, to increase the, uh, the total peripheral resistance. You guessed right, it's the arterioles, right? Now remember where the arterioles are, okay? If you tighten them up, what will happen? Well, two things will happen. One thing is you have discussed it, <clears throat> you have discussed it extensively. What will happen is the arterial blood pressure will increase because you have uh, constricted the arterioles, you're not letting blood, uh, the same amount of blood go through them. So the blood is being pulled in the arterial side, the pressure goes up. <clears throat> okay. Now the pressure goes up, increased blood pressure. Guess what is the effect of increased blood pressure on the heart? You remember the coupling factor which we discussed yesterday, afterload, you are basically increasing afterload. So you are putting a strain on the heart and its performance, its cardiac output. Yes? Okay. So this, what I have just described, basically this is what happens to the cardiac curve. This is the normal cardiac curve. It drops down into a lower profile because what you've done is you've increased blood pressure, increased afterload, uh, in, another, in other words, and hence the cardiac output, output bit point to point will decrease because of increased uh, afterload, okay? Uh, contractility, remember, being constant. We are not changing the contractility of the heart. We are only, in this, in this scenario, we are only uh, meddling with the TPR, okay? Right, so for that, the heart now in, uh, comes in lower, and this is the curve now, the cardiac curve. What happens to the veins? What happens to the venous return? Now there's an important point here, and I would, uh, if uh, I would be taking a viva, uh, sorry, I would be asking this question. The simple question, the simpler, there's a simple question and there's a hard question. The simple question is, why did, this, uh, did the venous return curve drop in this particular scenario? This is a simple question. Well, the answer to that is that uh, it's very clear that beyond the constriction, beyond those arterioles, you're not letting through enough blood which you uh, which uh, used to happen when you hadn't uh, meddled with or changed the TPR. Now when you have increased the TPR, the flow of blood has retarded in the sense uh, to, the, to the consequence that now blood coming into the veins has dropped. The volume has dropped. So when you in decrease the volume, you are decreasing basically the venous return. Okay. So naturally when the venous return will drop, the venous return curve will drop to the left and that's that it will meet the dropping cardiac curve right at this point and it's literally in the shadow of the normal point it has just dropped down at the same right arterial pressure this is an important point an interesting point as well how come the right arterial pressure remains the same because you have decreased contractility and you have decreased venous return in equal proportion so right atrial pressure freakishly will be the same because the two errors will just cancel out each other at the right atrium, okay? Now coming to the hard question, relatively hard question. I used to say this in our live classes, the candy question. Tell me how come the filling pressure is the same of the normal curve and this dotted curve? I'll wait for your answers in the uh, section below the video uh, and let's see who gets it right okay so uh, in tpr when tpr increases both curves i'm summarizing now both curves basically drop to a lower uh, 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 to a lower uh, situation uh, the equilibrium point basically drops vertically down at the same cvp uh, and here when you decrease tpr you just need to uh, basically uh, have a have a mirror argument uh, of what we discussed here the, the equilibrium point will rise up uh, the cardiac output will be improved because you have dropped after load the venous return will increase because the i.e. the preload will increase because the tpr has been uh, dilated and more blood is now flowing through uh, more than normal that is and so everybody is happy the right atrial pressure again is the same because the heart has gone up in its performance, but so has equally, so has the venous return. So equilibri equilibrium point will be the same, okay? Right, so this tricky lecture comes to an end. Uh, uh, these are the references. 
Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa